inspired is great, but to be inspirational is an honor. With these words, we have today the chief guest of our function, none other than Dr. Shekhar Vishwanathan, Vice President, Vellur Institute of Technology. Dr. Shekhar Vishwanathan epitomizes the vision, vibrant spirit, and energy that helped in establishing VIT as a premier institute in the country. Dr. Shekhar has over 30 years of experience in the industry and academics. He was a rank holder in electronics and communication engineering from the University of Madras. He received his master's degree in computer science from Roster Institute of Technology, USA. He had a PhD in the area of faculty motivation from University of Madras. During the 90s, he served as the vice chairman of his alma mater, Vellur Engineering College, which was later renamed as Vellur Institute of Technology. During this period, he had launched a number of new programs and initiatives which paved for the university status of VIT. Later, Dr. Shaker went to USA and worked with IBM, NetClerk, and Walmart.com to gain international industrial experiences. Walmart.com conferred the best engineering manager and best achiever awards on him. As vice president at VIT, Dr. Shaker focuses on the university growth strategy, at academic policies, international relations, and placements. He has brought in numerous improvements to benefit the students, including STARS, support the advancement of rural students scheme, fully flexible credit system, FFCS, semester abroad program, SAP, and curriculum for applied learning, CAL. Dr. Shaker was bestowed with the prestigious Young Yedge National Award in the year 2012 in recognition of his innovative and useful contributions to the field of education. He currently serves as the Vice President of EPSI, Educational Promotion Society for India, New Delhi, and member of National Level Higher Education Committee of FISI, Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, New Delhi. With this small introduction, to many of you who do not know about our chief guest of the event, Dr. Shekhar Vishwanathan, I think if you have traveled towards Chennai, and when you are near to Katpadi, I think you, know, you could have seen the tallest building on the either side of your track, where you can see the highest building. So, in a very quiet, short span of time, the Institute has achieved remarkable heights and it spread its wings around the country. With these words, I request our guest, chief guest of the function, Dr. Shekhar Vishwanathan, sir, Vice President, Vellur Institute of Technology, to address the gathering. My pranams to His Holiness Mahaswamiji. Good morning to all the dignitaries on the stage, off the stage, and uh, <clears throat> my students. When Professor Suresh called me, I was actually wondering, I am not a pharmacy man, I am an engineering computer science guy. Why do you want me here? But later I understood he's actually a big genius. He wants to hear from outsiders, not just pharmacists. And that was very well reflected in our vice chancellor's speech also, how different fields of expertise are merging. Right? So, I mean, <clears throat> Talking about Professor Suresh, not many of you might know that we are all very proud that he's a Vellurian like me. He was born and brought up in Vellur. So probably Vellur has that higher education in the soil. So, sir, he's a doyen of pharmacy in the 
country. Uh, you know, I didn't know that he and I went to the same school, the Wuris uh, School in Velour. Just now I came to know about it, and I'm doubly proud now uh, about after hearing this. You know, <clears throat> his accomplishments are so great that two of his institutions are ranked in the top 10 of NIRF, number four and number seven, the JSS, UT, uh, and uh, Mysore. I mean, it's an extraordinary achievement. There's a lot we can learn from him. You know, one of the things which I just heard from him during the stage itself, how he honors his guru, Professor Chinnasamy, he has not forgotten. I mean, this is a big characteristic. When many people go to the top of their life, they forget their gurus. They forget their humble beginnings. Now, these are small things, but have great impact. And I really admire you, sir. I really admire his guru also. So every day, we can learn. These are things we learn as we look around. So coming back to this conference <coughs> topic, which is about the international relations, global collaboration, I, I like the uh, <coughs> coining of bridging the barrier, uh, bri you know, bridges and breaking the barriers. First of all, let me talk about the higher education. There's a big paradigm shift going on, not just in our country, but throughout the world, but specifically in our country, thanks to the NEP, the new national education policy, a lot more liberalization has come into the existence. One of the core principles of the NEP is providing multidisciplinary education. I think that's what our vice chancellor also pointed out. You know, we cannot be living in islands or silos. All of our expertise need to culminate. That's when new things are going to happen because the challenges we face, you know, take for example the recent COVID-19. The entire world came together. Data scientists or pharmacists or engineers or mathematicians and doctors and scientists, everybody had to come together. It has become a matter of survival. Even otherwise, we need to all come together, bring in our expertise. You know, for example, BIT doesn't have a college of pharmacy, but we would like to collaborate with great pharmacy institutions like JSS in order to come up with great ideas. We are great in artificial intelligence or you know, cyber security or data science. But you know, there's a lot we can do in fields together. So such kind of fusion of knowledge becomes essential for uh, all of us to grow, for the society to grow. And of course, government has been moving in the right direction. The new education policy talks about uh, light but tight regulations. So I'm, I'm hoping that there will be more liberalization in our regulations to allow uh, growth in all sectors. But in the midst of all, we should not forget the student. For all the higher education institutions, the center of everything should be the student. The student-centric institutions are the ones which are going to finally survive. So any policy, many of you are here administrators who make policies for the higher education institutions. The, we have to have students' welfare, students' growth, students' uh, future in mind whenever you make policy decisions and we need to get feedback from the students. And we need to offer flexibility. You know, at VIT, we want to make sure, you know, a student who starts off with civil engineering gets to learn computer science or management they, they should have more options to uh, study their minors or specializations or come up with two degrees when they finish because at the age of 16 or 17 when they join their bachelor's degree they may not have a 
very good idea of what they are going to become. But as they move into their life, they get to learn. So the flexibility becomes very important. After students, it's about the faculty, right? Faculty autonomy, faculty empowerment can lead to wonders. I have seen it practically as an administrator. So I would request all the administrators to have that in mind. I know few things can go wrong, but eventually an education institution is going to succeed if the faculty have their autonomy and empowerment, if they feel empowered. When we, as education institutions, take up projects, I see many of them, many of the faculty or students, they just do some project and then submit some paper which just goes to sleep. Nobody ever even looks at it. That needs to change. That's the biggest paradigm shift which needs to happen. Any of the projects we do should be so socially relevant or at least be solving an industry problem. I'll give you an example. I visited Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It's a great university near Boston, WPI. There, they are well known for their engineering. They ask each of their student to go to some other part of the world, not just their nation, some other part of the world. They go to Asian countries, they go to Africa, and solve their society's problem using their engineering knowledge. So I, that's really appreciable. I tell my VAT students, WPA students have to travel 7,000 miles to see some problems. Here in Vellore, you just need to step out of the campus to see real problem. We have so many problems just outside our campus. We need to open our eyes and go there and help those people and solve those problems using our knowledge, whether it's pharmacy, whether it's engineering, whether it's medicine, whatever field we are, our fellow Indians deserve our expertise. Let's go out and help them. I was so happy to see the JSS Uti is helping the government hospital. All the services you are providing to the government hospital. Let's give a big round of applause. Now such social service by the institution stands as a role model for others. We don't just stay in the ivory towers, publishing papers in high impact journals. We use our knowledge to solve real world problem. That's the paradigm shift we need to see in this world. When we talk about application of knowledge to improve life, there's a long way to go for us as Indians. There are many Indians who are shining abroad. Take Sundar Pichai or Satyam or so many, Santanu, so many people shining abroad. But why don't we create a Google in India? Why don't we create a Tesla in India? It, it will happen. If Indians can go abroad and shine so much, why can't Indians do the same in India? It has started happening. I am very optimistic that we will be able to create our own Facebook or our own Google, which is going to be an international service or a product provider. We change our mindset. They say, right, a mind is like a parachute. If it doesn't open, it's a disaster. We need to open our minds, open to new ideas. Automatically, things will start moving. And I'm very confident with such conferences for the next three days, there are so many deliberations which are going to happen with across the disciplines. I'm sure we can come up with ideas, but those ideas should not just sleep in some reports. It should go out to the world and come up as projects, maybe patents, maybe products. 
I'm sure it will all happen. I also want to touch upon the globalization. We all know now UGC has opened up foreign institutions to set up campuses in India. So there is every likelihood that's going to be a game changer. If some of the top institutions are coming to this nation, I, I welcome them. You know, it's, it's a great competition. So all the institutions need to reinvent themselves. I, I think reinvent will be the right word, not just change, not just reform. You reinvent yourself, otherwise you cannot survive. You know, they say about this frog example, right? The frog is in the small bucket of water, and then it starts getting heated up. The flame is there. Initially, the frog will feel very nice. From the cold water, it becomes slightly warm. It will be very happily swimming. But as the temperature keeps growing, what happens? It's going to become boiling water. If the frog doesn't jump out, it's not going to survive. But if the frog keeps thinking, oh, I'm very happy the water has become warm, let it get heated up, let it get heated up. So things are going to change drastically in our country unless we prepare ourselves, we reinvent ourselves, it's going to be very tough to survive because we cannot think that degree alone can suffice. It's the knowledge which is going to help. And there are many international collaborations which are possible. You know, the, the most famous example I would think of is like the Human Genome Project, you know, which has resulted so many uh, good things for human being, whether it's the International Space Station. There are many such international collaborations which has resulted in great things for uh, humankind. I'm sure we can do wonders when we collaborate rather than just living in uh, silos. You know, I'm, I'm sure many of the Indian institutions sign great MOUs with foreign institutions. But whenever my international director comes and says, sir, we have signed an MOU, I said, that's fine. You know, two top leaders going and signing for an MOU and then posing for a photograph and then MOU goes to sleep, there's no point. It should be active. This understanding should result in some effect. So the long term is to have faculty to faculty collaboration between institutions, not just the top leaders. I mean, student exchange will be transient. But what is long term in such international collaboration is the faculty to faculty collaboration, whether it's research collaboration or academic collaboration, that is more long standing. And that's what will make the uh, system survive. And here's one last point I wanted to finish with. You know, many of the Indian institutions attract foreign students, but the number is far and few. We have to go a long way in attracting foreign students to India. It's not going to be that easy. But if we raise the quality of our institutions, thereby increasing the reputation and ranking of our institutions internationally, if we prepare our faculty and non-teaching staff to welcome and host foreign students, there will be a lot of cult cultural issues also. So if we change all that, and if we also increase the quality of our research and academics, I am sure Americans will study their bachelor's degree in India. The day is not far off. I'm sure if we put our heart, we will get there. Thank you. Thank you.